Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our session this afternoon, Getting to Know FEMA, Federal Emergency Management Agency. My name is Jennifer Mortensen, and I am the program manager here at UCI for our science, life science, and engineering programs. We're going to start off today's session with introducing our guest speaker, um, Gary Winfield, who is a program analyst in recruitment for the Office of the Chief Component Human Capital Officer. And in recruitment, he's responsible for working with the regions and program officers to assist with ever-changing hiring needs, planning, and attending hiring recruitment events, as well as partnering with colleges, universities, organizations, and associations. Gary is an alumni of the High Point University and comes to FEMA with a wealth of experience, including higher education, public relations, marketing, media, and firefighting. Thank you, Gary, for welcoming um, welcome today. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I want to say that I am really excited about today's uh, presentation. Uh, what ends up happening is that a lot of times people end up knowing about FEMA, but they don't know exactly about FEMA. And so I get excited when I'm able to pass on this type of information. Give me one second while I pull up my presentation. All right. As far as what FEMA is, as Jennifer said, with the Federal Emergency Management Agency, and our mission is pretty simple. It's to help people before, during, and after disasters. I know initially when I first came aboard with FEMA, our mission was a little longer than this, but I feel that this just encompasses everything that we, we do as far as helping people before, during, and after disasters. As far as our organization goes, FEMA is up under the Department of Homeland Security. Sometimes people think that FEMA is a standalone agency, but some of the other agencies under DHS, as you see here, Citizenship and Immigration Services, the Coast Guard, CBP, Custom Borders and Protection, uh, TSA, the Secret Service, and ICE. And up under the Department of Homeland Security is where FEMA resides, and we have a, a lot of different uh, things that we do. I know uh, probably about a year ago, we all, we had a, a DHS hiring event and, and all of the agencies up under DHS uh, participated, uh, including FEMA. These are some of our yearly average statistics. As you see here, we're a pretty diverse organization. Uh, when I speak about diversity, I know it's, it's not going to be perfect and we're always striving to get better with that, but it's also very friendly as far as veterans go because the mission that FEMA has aligns with people that have served in the military and when I go out to different events, I, I notice that veterans get excited uh, because they kind of get to continue their mission alongside uh, what FEMA does as well. As far as the different regions that we have, we have 10 of them. As you see here, FEMA is very, very spread out. So we have 10 different regions, anything from Boston all the way over to Bothell, Washington. I know also we work with Puerto Rico, Guam, American Samoa, and the Northern Mariana Islands. And, and this is really unique because it allows FEMA to be in touch and be in tune with what's going on on the regional level. So we have different regional offices uh, throughout the country. As far as some of our location functions, headquarters is where everything disseminates from. So this is, as you see here, we're setting policies, uh, administering programs, coordinating uh, with the region and the different fields, uh, just developing different procedures and, and things like that. And it all starts from headquarters. Next is the regions, and I touched on that on a previous slide when you saw all of the 10 different regions that we have. And regions are where things become implemented. So that's where we're able to build those partnerships and, and really implement the things that headquarters has established. 
And also it allows us to, to keep a finger on the pulse of what's going on when unfortunate disasters and emergencies do occur. Next is the field. And a lot of times people refer to the field as boots on the ground and boots on the ground and, and being in the field, uh, that's gonna be the primary face because those are the interactions that disaster survivors are going to have. They're going to be meeting with reservists and I'll, and I'll talk about reservists a little later on in this presentation, but that's where we're going to coordinate and, and we'll really be helping the people as we're out there when unfortunate disasters and emergencies do occur. As you see here, also part of our mission and responsibility is every employee has a regular and recurring emergency management responsibility. And what that means is that everyone that works for FEMA is deployable. And what that means is that whenever there is a need, we can be deployed out into the field. And I know for me, I had just started, it was 2017 and we had those successive hurricanes and it was, it was Harvey, Irma, Jose and Maria, all of that happened. It was back to back to back. And I was actually on leave and I was on vacation and then I got a deployment notification. And so what happens is, is everyone at FEMA, they refer to it as a FEMA phone, but it's, it's just an iPhone or sometimes it's an Android. And we, we have something, a system called DTS, which is the deployment tracking system. And what that means is it allows FEMA uh, leadership to know who is available in times of need. So what ends up happening is I get a deployment notification and I look at the notification while I'm on vacation and it says Carson City, Nevada, and it says that I need to be there. I believe it was in 48 hours. And that's also another thing. When, once you get a deployment request, you have between 24 and 48 hours to respond to that request. So I was sent Carson City, Nevada, and I know a lot of times people ask, well, what was going on in Carson City? I didn't think that there was a disaster there. Well, it wasn't an actual disaster in Nevada. What ended up happening was they were shutting down an actual office from a, working a previous disaster. And then when all of the successive hurricanes happened, they built it back up. And that's where the operation was going to be held. And, and what ended up happening was while we were there, they turned it into a, a joint field office. And, and what ended up happening was they built it up into a call center. And so while we were there, one building turned into two and we occupied another space. And while we were there was, I was doing, I was working in human resources and I was doing presentation with the local employment office. And I was explaining the positions that we have. And, and I'll go into that a little later in the presentation as far as the different employment types that we have but I was hiring for customer service representatives and supervisory customer service representatives. So I was actually interviewing people and I was extending tentative job offers and, you know, really passing along the information. And while I was out there in a two week span, I believe, I, first off, I didn't have, I maybe had one day off and I was out in Carson city, Nevada for about 37 days. And in a two week, Span, I think I worked 163 hours in that two week span. And I already knew what I signed up for and it was extremely rewarding. Was it long days and long hours? Absolutely. But it was extremely gratifying to be helping people that were going to be helping people. And I was out there for 37 days. And after that, I came home and I was home for four days. And then I got another deployment request and I was deployed to the U.S. Virgin Islands. And I was there for nine days and we were working on a special project where we were doing some local hiring in the area. And these were two different deployments. One in Carson City, we weren't in a directly impacted disaster area. And then the U.S. Virgin Islands, we were. And while they both were different, the, the feeling was the same. It was extremely gratifying and it was it was great to be able to help people in an area that had been directly impacted by a disaster. And that's some of the, some of the experiences that you'll have when you are deployed. But I will say that when you do get deployed, 
you definitely get to know your coworkers uh, on a on a better level because I was deployed with some people from my team and we got extremely close because we were working 12, 14, 16 hour days. Uh, and while it was hard, uh, I didn't once think that, oh man, I really wish that I wasn't here. It was extremely gratifying and, and I had a great experience and I couldn't have asked for a better first deployment to Carson City. And then also the U.S. Virgin Islands was, was a great time as well because I got to learn even more. And again, I was, I was helping people that were going to help people. As far as when disaster strikes, people think that FEMA is a first responder, but what needs to happen is, is once a disaster or an emergency, it has to be declared and then signed off by the president. Once that happens, then FEMA is able to come in and assist and help out in those different areas. As far as the response goes, FEMA just coordinates with a lot of different agencies. It could be different federal agencies, it could be local agencies, and, and these are some of the things that happen. And as far as the logistics go, uh, it, when I was in Carson City, Nevada, logistics was responsible for getting everything that was necessary for it to be a, a very fluid operation, as fluid, fluid as it can be, given the circumstances and given the, the quick turnaround as well. And some of the recovery, People tend to think that when, once a really big disaster happens, recovery is overnight. But recovery could be weeks, it could be months, it could be even years. And just because you're not actually hearing about the recovery process, it's still going on and it's an ongoing and, and evolving situation. And these are some of the areas that, that assist with that, whether it be individ, individual assistance, and that is kind of the customer service aspect of it. They have some other areas as well, but also public assistance, and that deals with the public works. I know as far as they do site inspection and, and things like that. So these are just some of the things that, that happen during the recovery process. As far as employment goes, I like to tell people it's not if you fit in at FEMA, but where you fit in at FEMA. And I say that because as you see on the right side of the screen, the different employments and different careers that we have, an attorney, logistics, human resources, engineers, public affairs specialists. And these are just some of the, the areas, some of the careers that we have at FEMA. So again, it's not if you fit in, but where you fit in, because it, it's really, uh, we have a, a lot of different experience levels and again, it's a lot of different areas for you to go into. So a lot of times people tend to think that you only have to have an emergency management background, but you see here with a, a public affairs specialist, it could be you know, radio, it could be TV, it could be a lot of different areas and, and grants management. So uh, I encourage everyone, if they are interested in FEMA to, you know, research just the different jobs that you have, that we have. And, and I'll go into that a little bit later as well. Some of the employment types, we have four, but I'm going to talk, I'm going to talk about all four, but there are three slides, one of which is permanent full-time. And that's typically what people think about when they are, when they're considering federal employment with PFTs, as we call permanent full-time positions, this is competitive. And what I mean by competitive is that veterans preference comes into play. And what veterans preference is, is if a, a veteran and a non-veteran are applying for a permanent full-time position, veterans receive that preference. And I'm going to let you see a job announcement so you can kind of understand what I'm talking about. And then also with permanent full-time uh, in that second paragraph, after one year continuous service, PFTs gain competitive status, and then you also have to have three years of continuous service as a PFT, and then you gain full career status. So this is, again, typically what people think about when they're considering uh, federal employment. And then also with FEMA, we have a couple of other employment types, one of which is called CORE, and it stands for Cadre of On-Call Response and Recovery Employee. Now, what's different from CORE than PFTs is that this is not competitive. And what I mean by that is a veteran and a non-veteran are applying for a core position. They're on equal footing because veterans preference doesn't apply for core positions. 
And then also what's different about it is that it's for an, it's on an appointment. And the appointment is either between two years and four years. A lot of times it leans toward the two-year side, but that appointment can be renewed, but it depends on budget, work performance, workload, need for the position. There's a lot of different factors. And then also core employees are eligible for the same benefits as, as PFT employees. And another thing that's uh, really that's different from PFTs is that when there are unfor unfortunate government shutdowns, core employees still come to work and they still get paid. And, and so those are some of the differences between core and PFT. Next is our reservist program, and this is our on-call workforce. And this is typically what people think about when they're thinking about FEMA is our reservist program and again, the boots on the ground. And with a reservist, you're on call. So what that means is uh, you have, it helps to have flexible full-time employment and then you would get a deployment notification and then, then you would have between 24 and 48 hours to respond. And then once that happens, you would be sent to a disaster location and then you would be doing work. Reservists are uh, categorized by their experience and we have a variety of different cadres, whether it be human resources, operations, security, IT. Uh, those are just some of the areas uh, that, that reservists work in. And, and once you're categorized as a reservist, you would go out, go out to a disaster location. And typically you would be out at a disaster location for at least 30 days. I know some of the cadres that I've worked with before have between 60 and 90 day deployments. But again, it all depends on the cadre that you're in and then also the need, because I know when I was out in Carson City, Nevada, being deployed, there was talk that I was going to be extended as far as my deployment goes. And that's what happens with reservists. And I know a reservist that I worked with in Carson City, which was about two years ago, they're still deployed and, and they just go from different disaster area uh, working and, and doing things like that. And lastly, the last employment type, and there's not a slide for it, is our local hires. And local hires are typically working from about 120 days max, and it can be extended, but it just depends on the need for what's going on. I know when we were in Carson City, Nevada, we were hiring for local hires, and they worked past 120 days. But typically, they, they let the local hires know up front that this is definitely a temporary employment situation, and it's going to be 120 days with the opportunity to be extended if there's a need for them. As far as some of the development options that we have, we have PMF, which is our Presidential Management Fellows Program. And this is, as you see here, for people with advanced degrees and, and recent graduates uh, within the previous two years. Our internship program, it typically happens, uh, you're looking for interns probably around once a year. And for the fall, that's when the announcement is usually posted. And then, and then the fall, they're looking for the next year's summer. So for this fall, it would be the summer of 2020. Another really good option is the student volunteer program. Um, and then with this, it's unpaid, but with all things, I encourage students and, and just people in general to really build your network. And, and that's what the internship and volunteer programs, that's what they help with. Because one of the best things to do is to really get an understanding of, of what you want, because you might have an idea of an area that you want to go in. And then once you get into that area, it might not be all that you thought it was or you could have been exposed to another area that really excites you and then you wouldn't have had that opportunity or that knowledge if you didn't have that volunteer option or that that internship experience so i encourage people to get as much information and as much experience as they can when building their network and, and seeking employment another one is fema Corps, and this is uh one of the things i, I see fema core resumes all the time and what ends up happening is, is uh, they get a stipend but also they're working in a variety of different areas whether it's disaster survivor assistance which is usually when uh, FEMA, FEMA reservists or FEMA Corps they're going out and 
speaking with disaster survivors and spreading information and, and getting them uh, the information that they might not otherwise might have had access to. But they're working in a lot of different areas. And it also helps because it goes back to that getting exposed to as many areas as possible so that you kind of know uh, what you're getting into and, and see if it still holds that same excitement as it did before you started working there. Another really important thing is compensation. People want to know how much you get paid. And with this, uh, we're on the GS scale, and GS uh, is, the, is what goes on around the country. And so we have different uh, pay for the different areas. So the Los Angeles, Los Angeles, Long Beach area will be different from the Washington, D.C. area, and Washington, D.C. will be different from Texas and so on and so forth. Um, and as you see at the bottom, the salary is based on location. So these are just some of the, the things, that some of the, the GS levels, and, and also what you want to pay attention to is whenever you're applying and if you're interested in temporary full-time employment and you see IC, uh, don't let that deter you because IC mirrors the GS scale. So if you see uh, IC7, it's the same as GS7. Um, it's just the different coding for the different employment type. As far as how to apply, one of the big things is that I really get excited about as well is helping people feel more comfortable about USA jobs because I've heard such glowing feedback as a black hole or an abyss and I, I want to help people to feel comfortable and not allow USA Jobs to let them feel like it's a very cumbersome experience. It's just about having the knowledge and knowing what you're looking for, and, and that's what I'm gonna help you do here today. As far as the how to apply USA Jobs, if you don't already have an account, uh, I suggest you can go on and, and search, and while we would love to have you at FEMA, if there's another agency that piques your interest or is more in line with what you want to do, all government agencies are on there. And then there we'll post those permanent full-time positions and those core positions and sometimes reservist positions. And then also some of those local hire positions as well. And you can search for, you can put in geographic location, you can put in a lot of different things. As far as how to read the announcement, uh, as you see here, on it's going gonna, it's gonna to give you the basic information, uh, who can apply, job duties, things like that. Uh, and what I want to do right now is I want to share an actual job announcement so that you, you see what is actually going on. Give me one second. Here we go. Thank you for bearing with me. As you see here, this is a job announcement for a program analyst. And on the right side of the screen, you see uh, who the job is open to. This one is open to the public. And a lot of times there'll be maybe a veteran's designation or a, a designation for individuals with disabilities, Schedule A, as for returning Peace Corps, a lot of those different uh, categorization. And then over here, over the overview, these are really important details. As you see here, it says the open and close dates. And what's really important is, is that federal employment, sometimes the windows are a bit shorter than private sector, uh, as far as private sector position. And what I mean by that is this one is open for 15 days. 
Sometimes there are positions that are only open for five or seven or 10 days. And so if you're interested in federal employment, it helps to continuously look at USA Jobs because there might be something with a short window that you might miss if you're not constantly checking on it. And then also right here is a, a, another really big thing is it says this job will close when we have received 200 applications, uh, which also could be sooner than the close date. So let's just say it was this, this announcement closed tomorrow. If they have 200 applications today, the announcement will close. And so again, it helps to go on, apply, and so you're in that in that number of 200 applications. As I told you before, you see here with the IC, which is the same as GS, it's the IC 13, and this is the salary right now. And it also lets you know what the appointment type is. Some, sometimes people get scared off when they see term temporary not to exceed. All that's letting you know is that it's a, a core position and it's a core appointment. And it is, it's temporary full-time and temporary full-time with it being two years, uh, you're going to get full-time hours and things like that. And you see the work schedule, which is full-time. The location, this is located in Sacramento. Typically, I haven't seen a lot of positions with FEMA that cover relocation expenses being reimbursed, but sometimes they do. Another really good thing about federal employment, and especially with FEMA, is that telework is available. Um, and it depends on your area for how much you're eligible for that telework. These are some of the duties, and you, you want to pay attention to this. And it lets you know here that every employee has regular and recurring emergency management responsibilities. And it also lets you know what some of the typical assignments will be. It lets you know what the travel will be. Also below here, the supervisory status, which it doesn't have any. And then also what the promotion potential is, which is the 15. And 15 is the highest on the GS scale. These are some of the requirements that you have. Have to be a US citizen, travel will be required have to be able to obtain and maintain a government credit card. And this is especially important right here. And this is what I like to tell people is when you're looking at these job announcements and you see qualifications, and then also what I highlighted right here is especially right here, this specialized experience. This is exactly what human resource specialists are looking for in your resume so that they can qualify it. Now, a lot of times people, tend to think that uh, there's a, a bot or a machine that's scanning resumes. It's not, it's actual people. And, and I know I have great relationships with some of the human resource specialists and these are what they're looking for. And sometimes as you saw there, there are upwards of 200 resumes that they're reviewing and they're looking for all of this in your resume. So this right here is the specialized experience. And this is exactly what needs to be in your resume. What doesn't happen is, is that a human resource specialist will not see a title and then infer that you had the experience or the specialized experience. It has to be clearly stated that you did this in your resume. And what also tends to happen is, is people take a private sector mentality when it comes to applying for federal positions. Because in the private sector, they tell you to keep your resume about, you know, one to two pages, keep it nice and short. Well, in, federal, in the federal space, you can just unlock that and open up your mind. Your resume doesn't have to be only one page or two pages. There have been resumes that I've seen and heard from some of my human resource colleagues have been upwards of 50 or 60 pages. And I'm not saying that that should be how long your resume is, but you do have the flexibility to really document all the things that you did. And what's important is, is that you're giving yourself credit for all of the experience that you've done. If you volunteered somewhere for years, and you feel as if it mirrors or it explains and it helps with that job and it pertains to what you're applying for, put that on there. If it means that you have to put more bullet points on there to explain what your experience is and so that it speaks to that specialized experience, put it on your resume. So again, 
really look at the specialized experience and tailor your resume towards that. Because also what tends to happen is, is this is a program analyst position. Some of the different program analysts within FEMA have different specialized experience. It just depends on the type of program analyst and what you'll be doing. So it, it will help that probably the core of your resume will be the same, but it will help for you to, to kind of tailor it and to tweak it just a little bit, just to make sure that all of your specialized experience is spoken for when you're looking at a job announcement. Give me one second. Gary, we had a specific question from an attendee if there okay. was any special experience that you would recommend if someone was interested in particularly applying for a reservist position. Uh, what I would say is the reservist requirements, they differ between cadre. I know I work with the security cadre and they are they have pretty strict guidelines as far as what they want from experience. So with security, they would like to have potential candidates with at least 10 years of supervisory security experience. Now, when I'm looking at resumes, there have been resumes that I've seen that have eight and a half, nine and a half, and I can't pass those resumes on. So what I encourage anyone who's interested in the reservist program is to go to our careers.fema.gov go to our reservist program and look at all of them. We have hide and show on the, on the website. So what that just means is like you click on it and it'll give you an overview of the cadre and what some of the qualifications are for each one of those cadres. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. And as, as I was talking about when we were looking at the, the job announcement, the federal resume is definitely very different and it takes people sometimes having to sit with their original resume. And as I said, give yourself that credit for all the things that you've done. If there are accomplishments that really highlight some of that specialized experience, put it down there. Uh, and, then, and then also make sure you're capturing that specialized experience in those uh, in, that are on those job announcements. So when you're scrolling and then you see specialized experience, your antennas should go up and you should look and see if my resume captures everything that they're looking for in that specialized experience. And another thing is, is that sometimes non-veterans become a little frustrated when they're applying and they're not getting referred and, and things like that. As I tell candidates, just keep swinging the ax and, and keep putting yourself out there. Keep applying uh, because the position that's for you will be for you. So don't it's easy to get discouraged when you're not getting referred or you're not getting selected, but keep, keep swinging the ax, as I like to say, uh, because uh, it'll allow you to, to get ready and, to, you know, to kind of fine tune your resume and, and do some different things. As, some of some, as far as some of the resources that, that we have, we have LinkedIn and, and I encourage everyone to go give us a, a follow on LinkedIn. We post positions there. And what happens when we post positions on LinkedIn, they will route you back to USA Jobs because that's where all of our positions are housed. And then also we do some best practices and, and things like that and podcasts that are that are pertain to uh, some different information, whether it be heat, whether it be flooding, whether it be emergency preparedness, just a lot of different things. So LinkedIn is a really, really good resource and I know I've gone on, on LinkedIn and, and looked and posted for particular positions, whether it be engineer positions or other positions as well. Uh, also, we have Twitter and Facebook, and, and this is more kind of high level as far as for FEMA goes, and it'll let you know kind of what's going on in the different regions and, and the things that we have going on. Another great resource is careers.fema.gov. And this will let you know about all the different employment types, as I talked about, the permanent full-time, the core cadre of on-call response and recovery, 
employee and then also the reservist program which it has all of our cadres on there and you can look and see all of the information for each cadre and the qualifications and see if the qualifications and the experience that they're looking for mirrors the, the experience that you have. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much, Gary. I appreciate everything that you shared with us today. And just to follow You're very up, welcome. If, thank you. Um, if anybody has questions to follow this session, let's see. Um, so the department director is Angela Jante. I have her email address and phone number there, and then myself with my email address and phone number. Um, in particular, some of the programs that we offer are emergency management and disaster recovery certificate program, and then other areas that students um, also follow suit would be our facilities management and also environmental management certificate programs. But we do have other certificate programs that definitely would fulfill jobs within FEMA as well. We have IT curriculum programs, engineering programs, management programs as well. So if you're interested in looking at any of the certificate programs that might fulfill um, areas that you're looking at particularly to maybe get a job with FEMA, um, our website is ce.uci.edu. And I want to leave this open. I know we had one question from our participant. If anybody else has any questions, please um, let us know now. You can post it in that chat forum still. Okay, so we do have one. Gary, mm -hmm. if you are fresh, no experience with getting the emergency preparedness certificate and getting involved in the certificate program next corner, what would be your recommended entry position? So they're talking about starting with our program and doing our four courses. Do you have a recommended path for them to get connected with FEMA and get a job? I would say if for the, the students, I would say the student volunteer program. So look into being a student volunteer and then that way you can just again, get a, a better, grasp on on what's going on and it allows you to gain some some working knowledge of of that area and you might get exposed to another area as well and and then also another thing is is depending on what type of full-time employment that you have the reservist program is also an option as well perfect so if they did this student position or even a volunteer position, that would be the best to get them some fresh experience first, correct? Yes, but I would also say that if you have a an emergency management facility where you're at to work on getting connected with them as well, okay. whether it be on the local or the state level or, you know, just again, because my biggest thing is I like to tell students is to constantly try to expose yourself to as many different disciplines as far as uh, emergency management goes. So you kind of get a working knowledge of what you might like. And then while you're doing that, you might end up liking something else. Yeah, and I don't know if this individual is currently working or not. Mm -hmm. um, but like, for instance, for me working for the university for our particular building, I um, used to be part of the emergency, emergency management team for a particular building that dealt with um, assisting evacuation of individuals when there's like a, a fire, you know, everything thankfully has always been a drill and nothing has been a true emergency, but I was able to position myself to be that person for the building along with our other team members. So in the event, if there was somebody who was harmed, how to take care of that person, where to get them to, and then assisting and waiting for the actual, you know, emergency team members to come and relieve me to aid that person should they have a broken arm or anything like that. So that was something that I got to be a part of that helped me to understand how I could be a better, you know, component with regards to even my work environment. So I don't know and if there's something like that. Go ahead. Oh, no, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was going to say, and that's experience that you could put on your resume as well, because it speaks to a potential, a potential position at FEMA. 
So again, okay. don't don't just think that, well, I was only a volunteer and I did it for the three years or I was only a lead and I didn't get paid. Really, I like to, to drive home, give yourself that that credit for the experience that you've done. And even if it's a a position that doesn't specifically speak to emergency management, there are some overlapping skills that and easily transferable skills that you have when you're doing different things. Mm -hmm. Could you recommend, I know people come from many different backgrounds, mm -hmm. um, any, I guess, basic um, traits or, you know, aspects that somebody might have that would transfer over that would be something that stands out I know, again, there's different positions also within mm -hmm. FEMA, but is there a common set of traits that are identifiable across the board? I would say a lot of it would be definitely customer service because mm -hmm. you're, you're dealing with people and sometimes you're dealing with disaster survivors on what could potentially be the worst day. And so having great customer service skills because when you're out, and you're in the field, it's not going to be your name talk to me like that. It's going to be FEMA talk to me like that. And so you just really want to have great customer service skills. I will say uh, project management and analyzing data and, and things like that and, and going over certain things. Uh, of course, Microsoft Office and, and things like that. But sometimes when you're when you're talking about different areas uh, they have like special specialized skill sets that they're looking for Perfect. But i would say definitely so, yeah. customer service and you know computer skills and you know the the project management or the program analyst because a lot of what a program analyst does uh, is transferable across some of those other things i know depending on the area that they're in but the core mm -hmm. of what a program analyst does uh, will usually be the same. It might be more technical once you get into different areas, but the core of it yeah. will be the same. Perfect. Yeah, so the panel or the attendee um, did denote that they are also right now helping document the emergency preparedness um, mm -hmm. for their company that they work for. And they okay. are just specifically looking to be a reservist or a volunteer during an emergency. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Well, if there are any more questions, I want to give just a couple of more seconds to make sure we answer everybody. And again, if you have any questions, you can email me. If you have any questions that specifically need to go to Gary, I'm more than happy to send those off to him as well. And I'm going to post my email address one more time in the chat session for anybody. Otherwise, I appreciate everybody for attending today. Gary, thank you so much again for all of your insight into FEMA, and thank you. You're very welcome. It was a pleasure, and I hope to be able to do this again. Perfect. Everybody have a great day.